of Intertech. We definitely appreciate you taking the time. My name is Pat Shaver. I am also with Intertech, and I will help moderate the discussion and uh, the presentation this afternoon. A little history behind these oxygen blasts. Uh, we, we use these as a way to uh, stay in touch with uh, uh, ever-increasing customer base, both nationally and globally. Uh, we've increased the topic ranges of the events, and uh, we do them much more frequently than we used to. So be sure to check out our website. I think at the end of the presentation, Tavin's going to have some um, uh, topics to throw at you, too, that you can join in for uh, in the coming month or two. Uh, but before Davin takes over, I just want to do a one to two minute intro of Intertech for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Our firm has been around since 1991, uh, and we've grown to be one of the largest software and IT training and consulting firms in the state of Minnesota. And we've expanded uh, in the last five to ten years, both nationally and globally. Uh, we've won over 35 awards for growth and top workplace best practices. Put simply, I like to describe it to people as uh, our employees love to work here and we produce some good results. But with all that, our focus remains on customer satisfaction. To that end, we've developed a, we've developed a um, model here of instructors who consult and consultants who teach. You know, Intertech has maintained some pretty stringent hiring practices that have helped us build a staff of highly experienced professionals that empower, not only empower Fortune 500 companies with software and IT innovation, but we also help to mentor, teach, and train their software and IT professionals and their staff. So it's not only a good recipe for us, it's also a good recipe for our customers and their growth. Um, so with that said, I'll hand it over, but I want you to know that I'll be on Twitter uh, with uh, using hashtag Oxygen Blast, and our Twitter handle is at Intertech Inc. If anyone has questions, uh, we can certainly dialogue there. Uh, or there is a chat panel uh, where you can uh, jump in and ask questions there at any time. And uh, we may not answer it right away, but we will for sure get to it. So with that, Kevin, it's all you. Okay. Let me make sure I stay unmuted here. There we go. Okay, about me. I actually, uh, hi guys, and thanks for signing up for this. I hope this is a meaningful hour for you. This gig here that I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a bunch of slides. I'm going to, we're going to work through some code examples. And then if you want, maybe I can make these code examples available for download if you're interested at the end here. We're going to take a look at a few different ways of doing asynchronous programming in .NET like we have here on the first slide. It's just some programming techniques that we should consider for speeding up our applications. And uh, just a little bit about myself, I've been programming professionally since about 1995, maybe 94, programming in Pascal, you know, assembly, C, C++, got to play with socket programming, for example, back in the old days, program for Unix, different flavors of Unix. And I also did web programming with Perl, ouch, Cold Fusion, classic ASP script, ASP.NET, worked with C Sharp VB and a little F Sharp. Not to say that I'm an expert in F Sharp in any mean. I'm not an expert in anything, really. Uh, be aware of anybody that says they are an expert. I also have worked with the different business intelligence tools with SQL Server. I started working with SQL Server back in the 6-5 days in 2000, 2005, and on up. And I have an employee here at Intertech. I am a full-time instructor, and I also a consultant occasionally when I can get out of the classroom. When I go do a consulting gig, though, it has to be rather short-lived so I can get back in the classroom. And an author. I'm not officially a published author with A-Press or O'Reilly or anything, but I have authored courseware with Intertech, a couple of courses I wrote, HTML5, and also the ASP.NET course. So those are some of the different courses I teach here, just a little bit about my background. I've worked with .NET since it was originally released back in beta format back in 2001, and I remember rewriting my applications for the beta 2, which was much closer to the official release. And that's really when I started working with C Sharp and BB.NET. Uh, understand that we do have several different classes, and one of the classes that covers a lot of these threading topics we're going to be talking about, especially the more newer ones with uh, down at 4.5, is our programming in C-sharp class. We have a five-day programming in C-sharp class, which has an entire chapter dedicated to asynchronous programming. Okay. Also, be aware that you may see, find some real interesting articles on our Intertech blog, which I've got the URL at the bottom of my slide there. Okay. 
All right, folks. So here's what we're going to cover. Roughly, some of these have a little more meat to them than other ones. Other ones are just like the bare bones. Uh, we're going to take a look at an introduction to multi-threaded programming just to make sure you folks understand what that really is, understand why we want to take advantage of that in our first chapter there. And then we're going to dive into the primitive types. Now, understand I'm not going to focus heavily on the primitive types because, well, quite frankly, they're great that they're there and they're something we've had. Some of them have been around since Dynam 1.0 whereas other ones are introduced in 2.0. And then yet a lot of these primitive types are actually been replaced. I shouldn't say replaced, but they've been encapsulated in these more atomic methods, which will take advantage of doing all this underlying clues for us with the new .NET 4.5 or the .NET 4.0 libraries and how they added in the new TPL, the Task Parallel Library, uh, and making it so much easier with less coding and then also less chance to blow our foot off with a gun, right? We know exactly what we're writing for code. So we'll talk about that in the uh, uh, primitive types are going to be primitives, then we'll get into thread safe collections. We'll talk about the standard collections, the generic collections, and then the new thread safe collections, which are pretty cool. I also have a code example. We'll take a look at the stack type, uh, specifically the thread safe stack. We use push and pop. Uh, we'll also take a look at the Task Parallel Library, and we'll take a look at a few different ways that we can use the Task Parallel Library with some of the different methods. Also, on um, user interface threading techniques, I didn't focus too much on that, but I did use, I created an example for us using async and await and ways that we can update the user interface. We'll talk about the basic rules when it comes to the user interface. And then our last module there's on debugging async code, and basically it's just some tips on how you can debug your individual threads or even tasks within Visual Studio. Presentation running 60 to 90 minutes really depends on how long it takes maybe going through some of the examples and explaining this stuff. All right, folks, I've only got 39 slides, so this isn't going to be super long, but I just want to maybe give you something to think about or maybe something to try out on a project you're working on or maybe just a little experiment. Uh, understand that multi-threaded programming, how it works, why bother? You know, how it works, it really is about performing two or more tasks or two or more processes or two, I shouldn't say processes when it comes to Windows processes, but two more two or more chunks of code executing simultaneously. That's what multi-threaded programming is about. You'll also hear people say parallel programming. You'll also hear people say concurrent programming. Uh, you'll, and a lot of times when people use these words, multi-threaded, concurrent, parallel, asynchronous programming, understand sometimes they'll use them to all mean the exact same thing. But actually, if you wanted to put on the white tape nerd glasses and think about it, um, you come across some people that will say, well, no, concurrent programming is much different than parallel. And multi-threaded is much different. And yes, if you get down to the nitty-gritty, they are much different. Concurrent programming means you have full-time, all-the-time code running in two or more threads or maybe processes. So these terms are overloaded, so people like to throw them around. But at the same time, they do mean something different. And you can look that up and find out, depending on if you really need to know what the exact difference is, you can look those up and see how you are using those. But when it comes to asynchronous programming for us guys, it's going to be uh, creating separate threads of execution or separate tasks and having them executing simultaneously. Asynchronous programming has been around since the late 60s. IBM was actually leading the way with that. Um, understand that multi-threaded programming never really took off for .NET. I remember talking to my Java cohorts in uh, the early 2000s, and they were all about threads, and they still are all about threads in ways of eking out more performance for their applications. But for .NET, I was always shocked at how .NET developers really weren't taking advantage of some of the asynchronous um, or parallel programming methods that are available. And to be honest, there really wasn't much drive for it. Back when .NET first came out, we were still dealing with computers that had single core processors in it. You had one processor and that was your computer. There weren't multiple cores or anything like that. So if you had one core, um, you, what could you really do? Well, you could scale up. You could buy a faster core. You could jam more memory into it. You could do some of these other things to make it run faster. But it, when you're saying you're doing multi-threaded programming, are you really doing something simultaneously? All you're really doing is passing the, passing that processor around back to the other task, back and forth, saying, oh, it's your turn, now it's your turn. And we really weren't doing anything simultaneously. Each, each, 
each uh, thread was just getting a little time slice. Depending on its priority, you can increase or decrease it, which was scary business. Um, but you could um, not really be do truing uh, multi-threaded programming because we only had one processor. You know, Intel and, and some of the other processor, the chip developers, of course, they continued over the years to scale up these processes and make them much faster, much faster, much faster. And then at some point, around 2005, they said, you know what, now we're going to scale out. We're going to scale out on the main board, so we're not going to make as fast a process. So, granted, they are still making them faster, but they say, they're basically saying and working with the operating system developers, let's start scaling out and adding more cores to our machines. By adding more cores, we can do more things actually simultaneously, more cores. And, of course, you remember Intel pushing their hyper-threading, which in some ways Intel's hyper-threading may or may not be full double cores, but maybe it's just two different conveyors feeding tasks into the same core. Now, you can do some research on the hyper-threading piece of it, but nonetheless, we do have otherwise, there, you know, more cores available where we can truly do multi-threaded um, applications, so we can have things running simultaneously on our system. And that's what's exciting. Now that we have these multiple core machines, even the junkiest free or uh, a affordable laptop that you can buy today or, or uh, uh, some of the other computers you can get have at least a couple of cores in them, two or four, or eight, eight, you know, cores into them. And in our servers, they just throw all kinds of cores at those. So we want our applications to take advantage of those. And that means coming back to us, the developers, and saying, hey, what do you guys got? Well, we had these original primitives like we're about to look at, but we've also got the task parallel library, which can wrap a lot of that up for us, making it easier. So one of the things we can do to dramatically speed up our applications, depending on the type of work they're doing and the type of processing, we can speed them up dramatically by using multi-threaded programming. Know that synchronous is different than asynchronous. When I was first learning asynchronous programming, I thought the word synchronous means to do things in the same time. I don't know. That's a misunderstanding I had as a kid. But know that synchronous really means you are doing all of step one, then all of step two, and then all of step three, or A, B, and C, whatever you want to say. Know that um, asynchronous means to do things simultaneously, to do it at the same time. Know that .NET, of course, didn't have this. We do have a multi-threaded programming with other languages, and even just libraries can be added to some of these languages to give them their capability. If you've been doing AJAX programming on a web page, you've been doing a form of asynchronous programming as well. I mean, that's what the A stands for in AJAX, asynchronous JavaScript and XML, although we usually don't use XML. We like to use JSON instead. So why bother? This is something to consider. Why should I consider asynchronous programming with my application or maybe an application I work with at my company? Know that it can make your application much more efficient. It seems to run faster if you take advantage of another core. So long as they're not locking you down to a single core, um, be aware of that if you have your application running in a virtual environment. Uh, so long as you're not doing processor affinity where you're locking it down to one core, um, you could take advantage of those additional cores, and it can run much faster. So we're not doing everything in a synchronous fashion. It can make your web application more responsive as well. I shouldn't say web. I should say any type of application. The worst thing in the world is for the user to freak out because it appears your application is locked up. You're going to get the three-finger salute from your users. They're going to hit Control-Alt-Delete, find their favorite task manager, and just go ahead and kill your app if it appears it's locking up you. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't, right? If you're doing some background processing and it's freezing your UI, that's a fail, right? And that's why we want to take advantage of some of the new asynchronous tools that we have available to us. And we want to take advantage of those multiple processors. Processors just continuous, continuously become cheaper and cheaper as well. It's nothing to buy one with eight cores in it now. Uh, it's amazing. And now with eight cores, and then you can go with 64-bit. You can get the, you know, outrageous amounts of memory in your system. And, you know, in the last, the coup de grace, of course, is to get our solid-state drives. If you can run those in a RAID situation, my goodness, you're, it's smoking. That's basically where the hard drives are waiting for the operating system. So why bother? Yeah, it, making your application run faster depending on the types of tasks that you have within it. Do you need to be downloading a file 
while you're also main, maintaining um, the form and making sure that a user can interact with it. Do you need to download three different files? Do you need to process multiple files? These are all excellent candidates for a multi-threaded application. And of course, let's put it out there, why not? Do you want to do this? We don't. We want to be aware that it could actually slow your application down if you don't write your your source code correctly. If you don't know what you're doing with asynchronous programming, you can dramatically bring it to its knees. So let's make sure that we know what we're doing, how we can use these special keywords and special types and members to make sure that it can create an application that will indeed be faster. Maybe your tasks all have to be done in a synchronous fashion. You always have to do task A, then task B, then task C. Even then, in those situations, you know, we do have special members available off the task type that's coming up uh, that will allow us to build that invocation list, if you will, very much like how we can chain delegates together. We can use the task type to say continue with. There's a continue with method if you want to have a callback, for example, to come back and run a different method when it's done. Just be aware that with multiple threads or asynchronous programming, it's going to be tougher to test as well, tougher to debug. That you talk to C++ developers that have been doing threads for years or Java developers, and they'll always tell you it can be much more difficult, especially in some of the development environments, following those threads. Starting in like Studio, I think it was Studio 2010, Microsoft really ramped up and made it easier for us to switch between threads during debugging and you can choose to debug a more than one thread in Visual Studio. And to continue to refine the debugging tools inside of Visual Studio just for um, .NET developers, but also for the C++ developers who might be working with GPU threads, for example. Yes, there are additional risks that are going to be added when you go down the asynchronous route as well. You may have heard of deadlock, a deadlock situation where you have this thread's waiting, you know, thread A is waiting for thread B to do something, and you got thread B waiting for thread A. Or maybe both A and B are waiting for thread C to complete, and thread C is dead or it's in a wait state. You know, those are deadlock conditions. They can be really difficult to find without proper debugging and also to solve the problem, especially if they only happen once in a while. That can be a, you know, that can be a hair puller. Besides deadlocks, we have race conditions where you might have two different threads trying to grab the same variable at the same time, and you can actually get corrupt data if one's writing while the other one's reading at the same time. Race conditions can be bad. Or if one is trying to update the UI when it shouldn't, when the main thread should be updated in the UI. Data corruption, there's also thread starvation. Nobody likes that. <laughs> Thread starvation, where you might have two different threads executing, and one says, hey, I'm really high priority. I'm top dog around here. So he all of a sudden takes up all your you know, processor, and then you might have other threads with very low priority. They're not getting any processor time. They're starved for that processor time, you know. So there's other situations, you know. You know, those some of those issues like thread starvation do tend to go away if you have multiple cores uh, because .NET and the operating system itself is smart enough to say, well, we got more cores that can handle some of these tasks. You know, on our machines, it's amazing how many different applications are running. All you got to do is open up the task manager, and when you open up the task manager, you can see all the different applications that are running. So here's Cisco uh, WebEx, 32-bit running, and 64 running in WAM mode, right? And if I go to performance here, I can see that I've got my processor busy running, and it's giving me this nice little graph here. And I can see there's 107 processes. Understand, of course, the word process means a single application running on my system. Whereas threads, wow, I've got a lot of threads running for 107 processes. When you go to your processes area, you can go into details. They change things around in Windows 8, and Windows Server 2012, and newer. I'm running Windows 8.1. But if you go into details, one of the things you can do is actually bring up the threads column. And you can see who's bogarting all the threads, who's getting all the threads for their application. Like my Windows Explorer apparently needs 64 threads. Here's link running 50, you know, so, and you can sort by column, which is also kind of interesting. Like, I've got two different instances of SQL Server running. Well, they just can't wait to throw threads at those. I got SQL Express, and then I had the regular version of SQL Server installed. So it's kind of interesting to see where all the threads actually exist. And when you go to performance, there is also the open resource monitor. And if you do this, what's neat about the resource monitor is you can actually see your processors. Like, there's my CPU there. Um, let's go to the CPU tab. There we go. 
And on my machine, I've got this zero through seven. These are all, of course, the cores. In reality, I have four cores, and I have hyper-threading enabled, and I can see the work that's being divvying up between the different processors on my machine. This is something you may want to look at with the current application you're running to see how the work is being divvied up, or if one server seems really busy, how is it slicing up that CPU versus how much memory you have, how much memory you're actually using, and disk and so forth. So this is another one of the tools that we have on our operating system. There are many great analysis tools available that are outside of Windows that you can either get for free or you can purchase them, and they're listed. There's a great book I'm going to mention at the end of this presentation where I'll, I'll give you a list of some of those books, not just for asynchronous programming, but also for just get, eking out the best performance you can from .NET. A simple example. All right, starting in with the primitives here, guys. I don't want to focus too much on thread and thread start. I think you guys would be disappointed if I did because most of you folks are probably here and interested in the task parallel library. But let's make sure that we understand how we can do a thread application. Just simple multi-threaded application and you're using the same objects we've had since .NET 1.0. Understand that in this example, I'm actually creating a second thread. Remember, every application that's ever running is running at least one thread in .NET. And technically, i got to tell you guys, in .NET, when your one thread is running, you actually have a couple of bonus threads coming along. One thread might be doing other tasks such as garbage collection, I believe, and then there's another one doing class loading and JIT compiling and all that good stuff. So there's two additional threads that will always run along with your primary thread. This is a simple console application, which is just doing some console write lines. But he's creating a whole other thread that's pointing to a method called do work. And he's going to go ahead and start that thread to go run that method. And when it's done, that thread dies. Here's what that do work method looks like. I'm having a pause for two seconds just to simulate a time-consuming process. And I'm grabbing information about the current thread. I'm really not using that. Oh, yeah, this thread. I'm going ahead and grabbing it, and then I'm writing out the properties about it, such as the name of the thread, what its current state is, if it's a background thread. By default, your threads are not background threads. When you create a brand new thread, it's also a foreground thread, which means your application cannot close until all your foreground threads have officially ended. If you try to abort them or interrupt them, well, then it's going to freak out, and it's going to actually throw exceptions for that. So you have to be careful about doing that. Also, there is thread pool threads, and that's changed over the years in .NET. Uh, for example, we used to have just 25 thread pool threads per processor core on your machine. And if you only have one processor, guess what? you got 25 thread pool threads. Then they cranked that up to 250, and then they changed it based on how much memory you have and what your application is doing. And each version of .NET seems to have changed our thread pool threads. Okay, so I've got this method called do work, and the very first thing I do is instantiate this delegate called thread start, pointing to that do work method. So this is really a delegate that's included in the system.threading namespace, that's where we like to play, system.threading, and then having it point to that method. Create a brand new thread, passing in that delegate, and understand that with the new ways that we use delegates, especially with the Lambda operator, and we're going to take a look at that in a little bit here, know that you really don't have to create an instance of thread start. You could just pass in the name of your method, do work, inside of this constructor instead. The compiler is smart enough to know, oh, well, the thread only takes in a thread start delegate, so it just automatically assumes that. So if you just pass in the name do work there, that's going to work as well. You get to name your threads. So I'm going to name my thread Buddy after my dog who's sleeping on my feet here. Know that um, you can only name them once. Naming a thread can be useful if you want to refer to a thread based on its name or maybe you're logging some information about it. But know that you can't go back and change it. Threads also have own thread local storage if you ever want to play around with that. That's where you can actually share information with other threads or even possibly other processes. Well, no, it wouldn't. It would be process local. So it's just within a particular uh, process. Here I'm writing out the current state of the thread before I've officially lit that fuse. Before you call start, of course, the thread state is going to be that it's not running. I call sleep to cause it to pause for one tenth of a second. And then the reason I do that is because I wanted to make sure it did officially start. Because when I write out the thread start at this point, using my console write line, it should show that it's in an actually wait sleep state because of the fact that I called sleep 2000 here. 
I actually have this project right here. <coughs> I should be showing this instead. As I said, you could just go ahead and pass do work directly into the thread type if you want, or you could use that thread start delegate. You know, it's all about hovering, guys. So get in a habit of hovering over any of the types. And you can see right in the tooltip that this is a delegate called thread start. There is also a parameterized thread start if you ever need to pass data to your method that you're calling. Set the name, do an accounts write line on my current thread state, and then I call sleep 100 after I start it and write out its thread state one more time. So if I go ahead and run this guy, I can see it was unstart initially, then it was in wait, wait sleep join state, and then of course I wrote up some basic information. Notice the thread priority is normal, background thread false, I didn't change anything, and thread pull thread of course not, because it's my thread that I created. And then, you know, what's interesting is I can go back here, maybe I'll make it pause for three seconds here, and then I'll write out its current state one more time. You know, so if I do this, just write it out after it completely runs, you'll see that it's now considered stopped. That thread is no longer running. That thread is basically, other than the fact I have a handle to it, it's done. Know that creating threads is a bit of an expensive process. And yeah, you can write code here to create 10,000 threads just for the fun of it and light them. I used to do that. I've done that in previous presentations, but uh, know that if you do that, of course, it, creating threads unnecessarily is a very expensive process. We don't want to do this unless we know that we're going to use a thread and we want to do something asynchronously. Okay. Oh, by the way, this is kind of interesting as well. Let me go ahead and get rid of this code. I'll just comment that code back out again. I can convert a secondary thread to be background just by saying is background equals true. Understand that if a thread is a background thread, it's not going to stick around and wait for it to finish. Notice that my code ends here with the council write line, and there's nothing left in my main method. Well, this guy's going to pause for two seconds down here. It's not going to wait for him to finish. So if I go ahead and run this now, because I changed them to a background thread, it just says, yeah, done. That background thread, he was busy saying, okay, I'm going to count to 2,000, and he got maybe about 500. <laughs> Maybe not even that, right? And he was killed off. And this is not a best practice by any means. Anytime you have a secondary thread, no matter how many you've created and launched, you want to make sure that they've officially been interrupted. There's an interrupt method you can call off of it. And you can only call it if it's been set to a state where it's uh, maybe in wait or join mode or in uh, sleep mode. This is safe because of doing it when it's in sleep mode, when it's in that particular state. But otherwise, if your thread's right in the middle of something, maybe it's writing to a file, writing to a log, posting information to the Internet, pulling information, we don't want to just kill it off just like that. We want to make sure that our application waits for it to finish. And that's something we can do just by making sure we have our is background is equal to false. And now this will just continue to wait. And it, can, and it completes at that point. So I don't need to type this in technically because that's the default value anyways. It's always going to be a background thread. There's other things you can do within here. Know that, of course, you know, thread two dot, I always put my cursor afterwards and do a control space. Find out what else is available. There is a priority, for example, and you know, all the documentation I've ever found tells me do not crank the priority up of any of your threads. Don't say mine's really important. Uh, they say that this generally can make it a runaway thread. Instead, uh, you know, and it, it, no matter what you try to do to your priority for your thread, the operating system is still going to have the final say. The operating system is only going to give you so much time slice and says, yeah, I've got other applications to run. I've got 100 other applications. So this is how much time slice you're going to get. Instead, you know, what I believe is you, if you want, if you do have a runaway thread that's in a looping condition and you want to make sure people can kill the application, if for some reason you, you want the application to be killed, you can set the priority to something low. If you wanted, you could set it to something really low, and that would make it easier to kill the application. But for the most part, we're not supposed to be messing around with the priority. Okay. All right, folks. So I'm going to come back into the slides here. I talked about all that already. 
there are some design patterns, you know, especially you talk to Java developers. I always find that the Java developers love design patterns, but there are design patterns specifically with Microsoft even. We've got a link at the bottom of the slide here. These design patterns speak to the different ways that you can do asynchronous programming. And what we've had in the past, you know, .NET's got such a history. .NET is 12 years old now. You know, we've had so many different versions of .NET come out. It's 12 years old. Um, like originally, one of the ways that we could do asynchronous programming, of course, was always to use the thread type. Another way was to actually set up begin and end operations. So you could have a begin invoke. Well, I shouldn't say invoke because that's talking specifically to the delegate type. But you could go ahead and say begin get data and end get data. These, you could set up these two different types of methods in your class. And then you could return an IAsync result type, which could even go ahead and return an identifier and the specific data you're looking for. This was the original APM design pattern. Anytime you're reading any of these books and they throw that APM at you, they're just talking about something that's old-fashioned, the old, old way that we used to do asynchronous programming in .NET. And yes, the delegate type right out of the box since .NET 1.0 has supported the APM. For example, they do always have the begin invoke and end invoke methods, which are always available. And end invoke will return data to you in an IA sync result type. You could even do polling, like you could check the is completed property inside of a loop. Um, you could do waiting, where you just call the end and end invoke or end op name, and you just sit there and your code, your code will actually pause and wait until it's done processing. And then, of course, you can also have it call back into another method when it has completed. That's all part of the APM. And know that the asynchronous programming model is supported by other frameworks as well. But we did use it quite a bit in earlier versions of .NET 1.0 and 1.1. In 2.0, it was already becoming um, less used because we did have more support in the system.threading namespace. Uh, the event process or event based asynchronous pattern, the EAP, is another legacy and it's fairly recent yet though, uh, that's based on where you have event handlers such as whatever the name of your method is, it'll run it'll actually be named with the word async in it. As you can see, we've got run XXX async. Those methods can run in the background and be called in response to event handlers, perhaps on a WPF or a Windows Form application. Now, with these run async, they can actually go ahead and do something in the background, and then they can raise events that have been predefined in the form. You'll have to make sure that your events are based on a send or post callback delegate type, but this allowed us to have a interactive user interface while at the same time we'd have these async methods inside of our, or maybe in our code behind for a form. This is another pattern that was also available. It still is. All these patterns are always available in .NET. Microsoft isn't killing any of these. But know that this is what Microsoft also considers a legacy pattern. And of course, the new one, the one that they recommend for new development, is to focus on the task-based asynchronous development. And this is based on the system.threading namespace again, but also based on the task namespace. The task namespace is introduced in .NET 4.5. And with the task namespace, we have a special class in there called task. You'll use a single method to go ahead and launch a separate thread to call a method. It's much, much cleaner. Much less code is required. Guys, if I go ahead and click on this link, just to, for the heck of it here, this will bring up that article, and it talks about those asynchronous patterns right here. And you can click on any one of these and actually see that information. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and copy this. And for you folks that have used WebEx, you may know that um, I should be able to send this to all attendees in the chat window. I can send that link to you if you want to copy that. Guys, how the heck do you get to the chat window? Up at the very top, you see the green bar. It says you are seeing Davin's desktop or whatever. If you hover over that, over to the right, you should find a link that says chat next to the participants window. When you click on chat, then you should be able to see the chat window. I can't leave mine up because it causes a gray X's screen thing on your screen. You're probably seeing a little one for the recorder up in the corner. But uh, let me go ahead and close this. All right. Um, primitive types. Folks, in this second section here, I just wanted to mention some of the types that are available in system.threading. And really what this comes down to, sure, I went ahead and just closed my browser, is taking a look at the system.threading namespace and some of the types that we have. 
I don't want to focus on this, but here in this namespace, we do have a lot of different classes available to you. And you can see them down the left side with a nice description down the middle here as well for system.threading, right? And uh, with this, I'll just go ahead and send this to everybody. There you go. Uh, with this particular namespace, we do have a lot of different types that can be used. Again, these allow you to work directly with your individual threads, for example, or to work with um, maybe swapping out variables between two different threads. Uh, we have diff a lot of different types here that I'm going to talk about in my slides. For example, there's a barrier type. You can imagine a barrier type, which you can go ahead and create an instance of, and allows your task to take turns, maybe processing an algorithm. I feel like the barrier is one of those things that maybe uh, allows the threads to catch up with the other threads and everybody's taking a turn with an algorithm. Each thread is processing part of the data. You know, it feels kind of like a relay race where the, each one are catching up with the other two or one thread's waiting for the other two and when they're done, then he gets to go again. And each take their turns. No thread gets left behind. That's what I basically wrote for the description here. It waits for the other threads to take their turns before continuing. You can use the barrier type for that if you need that, if you're working directly with threads. Again, these primitive types are not necessarily something you may be working with if you're going down a task parallel library. And that's why I just have a brief description. Interlocked, if we need a very safe way to increment a variable, a thread safe way, we can increment, decrement, we can compare and exchange variables. They're all available directly off the interlocked class. You can call any of these static methods available with it. Again, for doing some of that simple math, it can be really nice when you're sharing a resource, such as available with other threads, and you don't want to have to put a whole lock command inside of your code or, you know, define a whole critical section. All you really want to do is change a variable or maybe swap variables. We have a lazy initializer. If you don't want to, if you want to make sure certain objects have been instantiated and they need to be instantiated only if necessary, you can use a lazy initializer for that. Maybe they're being used inside of a method, and in your method, you'll just make sure that when they pass them in as reference types, uh, they actually had values. You know, you can do the lazy initializer to make sure everything has been instantiated. Manual reset event, if you need to notify another thread that an event has occurred because this one thread is subscribing to the event but the other ones need to know about it, you can use a manual reset event. But that can be an expensive process and I want to talk about the slim ones coming up here shortly. A monitor, of course, does allow you to define what they call a critical section. A critical section is a chunk of code that you basically only want to allow one thread at a time to execute. Understand that you have probably seen monitors in the past, but you've been using the special keywords that C-sharp or VB give you. C-sharp likes to use the lock command, and what they recommend with the lock keyword is you should actually specify a static variable. Instead of specifying an instance level variable, which might be shared with multiple threads if they're sharing the same instance, it's recommended to use a lock variable. We want to make sure or the lock variable with a static variable, sorry, so that it's guaranteed that only one thread can ever enter at a time. VB uses the keyword sync lock. But know that both lock and sync lock, they're both just syntactic candy, that's what they like to say, right, for really just using the monitor type. And the monitor type allows you to define this chunk of code where only one thread, like I said, can only ever enter at a time. Be aware that as soon as the thread exits that area, well, of course, the next thread can enter in. If you just use the lock keyword, it's all done and managed for you automatically, whereas if you use the official monitor type, you have to call a special method called pulse when you're out of there. You'll call pulse, and that basically says to another thread that's waiting, okay, you can come in. There's also like a pulse all to let them all in. Um, again, critical sections should be as absolutely small as possible. If you have a thread waiting because you have a thread inside, you're no longer multi-threaded programming. We want to make sure we have as many threads running as possible. And the only reason we define like a critical section is when we want to make sure that we're uh, locking that data so it can't become corrupt while we're making changes to it. Mutex, how cool is a mutex? A mutex allows you to define another type of lock, again, preventing 
perhaps another type of application from getting access to a resource. Imagine you have two different applications that are using a special resource, such as a file on your system, and you want to make sure that of those two applications, only one of them can access that file at a time. That's what a mutex can do for you. It stands for mutually exclusive. You're really, and by the way, with the mutex, you're really calling a special Windows API to create a Windows lock. With the mutex, you can actually define a mutex with a name. If you give it a name, that means it can be seen by the other processes running in Windows. And that means that I've got an official lock called this. It doesn't really lock anything, but it's basically a flag in the snow. You, you're throwing a flag into the property and saying, this is mine. I got my name on my mutex, okay? And I'm using this resource. So the other applications which know about the, res the mutex well, can actually check it to see if they can get a handle on it. And if they can't, then they know somebody, another application is using that resource. Obviously, they have to have respect for the mutex. If they just want to go directly to the file and corrupt everything, they could. And also be aware that the mutex, when you give it a name, you want to make sure it's unique and that other applications aren't giving it the same name. Mutex works across processes, though. That's what's different. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, also know that if you don't give your mutex a name, if it's an unnamed mutex, then it's just a lock that's established within your application. You have the choice. Do you want to give it a name or not? If you don't give it a name, then it's going to be used just within your application. I have seen people use the mutex to also prevent multiple versions of the same app running simultaneously. Like, for example, if you ever try to run your application and try to start it up again, and all of a sudden you got two of them running in the taskbar, I've seen people actually use the mutex type to make sure that only one can ever run. You can do a search out there on Stack Overflow and some of the other examples. There may be some other ways of actually detecting if it is running, though. But a mutex is one of the ways to do it. Do some careful research. A reader-writer lock, this will allow, um, like, one or more threads to actually read a resource, but only one to actually write to it. Again, that's a special type of lock that we have. If it's just controlling access to one object, this is oftentimes much faster than using a monitor and much lighter weight. Semaphore was introduced in Donna 2.0. A semaphore, they actually have the meaning, a different meaning in the UK that stands for like traffic light. In a semaphore, when it comes to whether it be Windows or whether it comes to .NET specifically, it'll, you can limit the number of threads that have access to a critical section, for example, or a resource for that matter. Uh, with a semaphore, you might want to set it up to only be five threads that can access at a time, and when one of those pops out, then the next one can come in. That's what the semaphore type is designed for. You can basically, in effect, create your own pool of threads running, like the thread pool uh, or a, a thread, a group of threads that need to access a resource, but you want to limit how many of them are accessing it at a time. Like, I don't want any more than five threads accessing this file, or I should say this database. You could do that with a semaphore. Thread type, we've already talked about that. And of course, the thread pool is actually a group of threads that are already included with .NET. And you can do some research, but every version of .NET that's been released seems to modify the number of threads in the thread pool that you get. I think the latest version now makes it quite variable, so as more threads are needed, they add them in and then they're removed. Thread pool threads do fibers of execution. You might have a thread in a thread pool do one instruction in your code and then leave and another one takes over. You can also queue up threads from the thread pool to do um, special calls to certain methods if you'd like. They do have a special method off the thread pool class where you can go ahead and queue up a a user method. So if you wanted to call a method of your own directly, you can. Otherwise, know that the thread pool is full of threads doing all kinds of really useful stuff, like calling your finalizers if necessary on objects where somebody didn't call dispose, or doing other kinds of tasks right within .NET applications. Know that the thread pools are per process. So if I tell you that there's this many threads in the thread pool, that's for that one app. Again, it could be based on the number of cores you have, how much memory you have, and other factors. There is a timer type where if you wanted to call a specific method on a regular time basis, you can use a timer for that as well. Okay, folks, on this slide here, I'm mentioning some of these slim primitives. These are three primitives that you'll find have the exact same name as an older brother that were on a lot longer, but Microsoft created these primitive types in .NET 4.0. Like, for example, the manual reset event. If you go actually go look at that, they'll probably recommend that you actually use a manual reset event slim because it's much lighter weight. 
you know, using these slim types for any of these three really oftentimes are a little bit simpler. They'll use less memory. They'll give you a little bit higher performance. And also, they're usually a little bit safer as well, preventing some of those threading errors you might have. Um, so know that they do have these three different slim types. You'll see them when you go to system that's threading if you're ever interested. But the slim types are oftentimes preferred over the old fashioned other than their parent types, if you will. Okay, guys, in the interest of moving along in the time here, let's talk about the .NET 4.0 Thread Safe Collections. Uh, I call them the Bob W's, uh, which means the best of both worlds. These collections bring the best of both worlds for managing collections, making sure that they're type safe as well as also thread safe. Like, for example, the original collections that Microsoft gave us way back in .NET 1.0 included collections such as the array list, the queue, the stack. Uh, I think there was a hash table in there, and, and uh, which was a dictionary object, and a sorted list. You know, we had some of standard collection types they did offer some thread safety. For those standard collection types like those, we did have a property called synchronize, which we could go ahead and set to true as a Boolean property that we could go ahead and set. Still, the problem with those standard collection types is they store everything as system.object. They're not strongly typed. If I want to create an array list of integers, they store them as objects, which means they're going to be boxed up on the heap, which is not cool. And then when I pull them back out, i got to cast them back as an integer, and i got garbage to clean up. All of the applications we create today, anything we create today, should never use the system.collections. Collections. Okay, those things are... I'm surprised Microsoft hasn't deprecated them yet. There may be some situation where they can still be handy, like I need to store system.object types, or I want to store a bunch of different types of objects in there. And I guess those make sense, but rarely do we ever use ArrayList anymore or queue. We should always be using the generic collections instead. And this is something I always talk about in the C-sharp class. I talk about how we always want to use those strongly typed generic collections instead, like the list type. And of course, the generic queue and stack, whatever we're using. Well, for multi threaded programming, we have the thread safe collections available as well. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention that third bullet point. Check, check it out, guys. As much as I can push those down at 2.0 generic collections, they're not thread safe at all. You know, at least the original collections had a little bit of thread safety with the synchronized property, but. Uh, absolutely no thread safety whatsoever with the standard generic collections. And that's why Microsoft created the, face, the thread safe collections. Uh, these are the uh, collections such as the blocking collection um, and the concurrent. You know, I'm just mentioning here that the thread safe collections, like blocking collection, they're going to use some of the primitives we just talked about to control access, such as spin lock and semaphore slim. Whereas other collections, like the concurrent queue, they're just going to offer additional methods to access the data in the queue or in the collection. So here they are, guys. Here's the official thread safe collections. And notice that we're in another sub namespace. So instead of system.collections.generic, we're actually located in system.collections.concurrent. And some of these collections are a little bit complex, like those last three partitioner ones. That's um, a little bit more advanced. That's where you actually are partitioning out your collection. Uh, depending on how you want to break it apart. Whereas the other ones that I find kind of interesting are, um, well, for example, I like the concurrent bag. If you just want to have a bunch of name value pairs with no real order to them, you can use a concurrent bag. It reminds me of the old VB6 property bag. You know, if you do want to have just a bunch of name value pairs in an unordered collection, you can use the concurrent bag. Uh, understand we also have the concurrent dictionary with key value pairs as well. Again, this is going to be thread safe how you access those so that no thread could be reading one or writing one at the same time. Or more than likely, here's some of the problems you're going to have, guys. If you're working with a queue or a stack, if you have multiple threads going to that thing and removing things from the queue or the stack, like, for example, let's say you have five threads coming into the concurrent queue, and they're all calling DQ, 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 DQ. Well, what happens when it checks, you know, maybe a thread is checking the size and says, oh, DQ, I see there's size one, but another thread has already come in and DQ'd it. This is where we can run into some real problems because we're going to get exceptions that pop up. So what they did with these special collection types is they gave us special methods to make them thread safe. Like, for example, for the queue, the current queue, a concurrent queue, they actually give a method called try DQ. Try DQ. 
which means to go ahead and try to defuse something out of that queue, remove it. And uh, they also have try pop, try pop with the stack to go ahead and remove something off the top of the collection. It'll, it won't raise an exception if there is nothing left in the actual collection itself. That's key. So they're going to give you threat, uh, methods that are not going to raise exceptions. I got an example where I went ahead and created a solution here that used the concurrent stack, and I used the try pop. Now understand, um, notice I said LIFO and FIFO. You guys know that first in, first out is like a shopping cart line. First one in is going to be the first one to come out of the collection. That's when you use the NQ and DQ methods with the concurrent queue. Whereas LIFO is like a stack of plates at a buffet. But the very last one you put on the stack of plates is the first one to come off, and that's why they call it a stack. And you have to use different methods to do those. So if I go ahead and open up this uh, project, which I called a uh, stacker. There we go. In this example here, and hopefully you guys are able to see this, okay. In this particular example, I have a class called program and I have a static concurrent stack. I went ahead and declared it up here at the class level. And he's gonna hold on to a bunch of strings. Great, we got one that's gonna hold on to a bunch of strings. And in this case, initially I'm gonna be creating a uh, array of threads, and I'm choosing three threads. So I'm going to create this array of threads, size three. And before I do that thread, I should have mentioned this place orders and stack. I'm passing in how many orders I want to have in this collection. I'm going to add in 100 strings, okay? So I'm going to pass in that number 100 here into place order and stack. And if I click on that word and hit F12 to go to that method, right down below here, it's only on the next one. I do a little for loop, and I'm using the push method. Now remember, the push method is adding them in one at a time, and we're doing this last in, first out. So as I continue to push, I'm adding another plate on top of the stack here. And this continues to loop until I get to 100. So for i equals 0 to 99, really. And I add those in with the string order and then that number, and I write down that information. I also write down how many orders are added. And I'm writing on a console I and to go ahead and press any key to process them. I got a little console read key in here. So after I go ahead and fill up the queue or the stack, I should say, with 100 items, then I create an array of three threads. And then for each one, I point to the process method, which is this guy down here. I point to each one of those, and I light the fuse on all three of those. So I create three threads. And I have all three of them pointed to the same method, and I call start. Now, down below here, in my process orders and stack, I'm defining an empty string here just called S order. And then you can, it appears I have an endless loop here because I'm doing while true. And here is where I'm going to that collection, and I'm calling try pop. This is going to remove, basically the purpose of the pop method is to remove something from the top of the stack. It's always push and pop in any language you work with for collections. It's usually that anyways. So here I'm going to go ahead and try pop. Just in case we're down to zero, this will go ahead and remove one. And if there isn't any more available, don't raise an exception. So actually the try pop, I should take that back. You can see that it's returning a Boolean. If it returns true, great. We have one we can work with that's coming out in that out style parameter, S order. If it returns false, we're done. So I just go ahead and break. So if a thread comes into this in a loop and all of a sudden try pop returns false, he bails. But remember, we have three threads at a time running in here. And they're all writing to the console. The thread ID, I decided to go ahead and write out its manage thread ID here, and I'm also writing out the actual order. Now, there's a major violation going on here, guys. In the, for the most part, you're not supposed to have multiple threads writing to a UI, and I've got all three of them running in here right now, council right lines. You know, so what's going to happen here is we're not going to see everything be in a perfect order. Whoever gets handled to the council first is going to write out that information. So they're all going to come in here, and all three threads are jamming around here, just popping things out of my stack until it runs out, and all those three th threads are going to die then. And then I write down my main thread is done. So when I go run this, you can see 100 orders were added. That's great. I hit space bar. And then what I want you to see is <coughs> they're not coming out in perfect order. I can also see the ID of the threads over here. 
I told you guys we created three threads, right? When I created three threads, why did it start with thread three? Well, remember, every .NET application actually has three threads running in it. There's the first two that are used by the .NET framework while they're running your application. Like I said, there's garbage collection and JIT compiling, class loading, and all that good stuff, all those endless core DLLs that make up the .NET framework. And then we have the other ones. These are the three that I created. The thread ID starts on three. And you can see the first one, hey, he got order 99. That was the last one. And then we got thread three process 97 because another thread jumped in and got 98. <laughs> 98 was down here by thread five. That's funny. How five get ahead of four? Anyways, you can see that all of these threads are randomly running, pulling things out of this collection. Also, I got a weird here. Main thread done. Well, the reason that's showing up is back over here in main, after I call start on all three of those, those first couple of threads are already jamming and writing out to the counts before my main thread finally comes on here and says main thread done. But remember, those other threads are all foreground threads by default, so they go ahead and execute. So this is showing me how I can use a concurrent collection here. And then, of course, I can see the results that are showing up. And, you know, you can have a lot more fun with this. It doesn't have to be three, right? Like if I wanted to, I could go ahead and change this to six threads and run it. You know, now I'm jamming six threads through there. And we can see how the or – they're going to come back all completely randomized. But the key is that I don't want anything else. You know, after I pull pop everything off the stack, I don't want it to cause an exception. I just want to grab all of them. And I could do this within Q and DQ as well. If you can think about it, it's great to have a try pop. Do they have a try push? Well, no, there's no real limits, right? Unless you specifically wanted a hard coded size. But you can take a look at some of the options that are here. It's try peak just to try to look. Try pop range. It attempts to pop and return multiple objects if you want. And there's some of the other extension methods. You see these ones with the black arrows? Those are all extension methods in .NET, which means that they are. A lot of these, to be honest, are the ones that we use in Link as well. These are the normal extension methods we have for retrieving details of the information. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks for hanging with me. So uh, the Task Parallel Library is something that Microsoft introduced with .NET 4 all. The task parallel library is designed to save us a considerable amount of code, to save us even more code that might be needed for doing asynchronous programming. Like, I'm sitting there playing with all these threads and having to launch those things called start, maybe possibly creating a thread start delegates, a thread parameterized start delegates and all that good stuff. You know, I'm being in control of my threads and watching my threads. That's one thing, but I can greatly simplify my code by using the task types instead. As a matter of fact, starting in Studio 2012, look at this. If you just let me go all the way back to my desktop, I'm just going to go ahead and fire up Visual Studio 2012. Hey, Visual Studio 2012. You're so ancient. You're like two years old. So I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new project. And whatever type you want to create, here's a garbage console project. You'll notice right away at the top, Microsoft is so excited about the task library that they give me them a using statement up here. I remember when they dealt with collection generic as well and link. And of course they've given us string builder access now too, but they purposely have given us this using statement as part of their project templates in the assumption that I'm gonna want to use a task type. They're going to, you can see how they're showing up right in the IntelliSense because I already have my using statement here. I can use the actual task type itself to point to a method. I can use a task factory. I can call a special uh, task factory method, I can schedule a task to run. A task is basically like a thread where I can have a task be created and point to a method and I can light that fuse. I can run that as a separate thread without me having to worry about creating an instance of a thread and specifying the method and all of that good stuff. Sure, it might be doing some of that stuff in the background, but now I don't need to worry about all that heartache and all that hard work. Some of the interesting objects that we do have in the task namespace, we've got the task type itself. I'll talk about the task class. And we've also got task result. Now, those two are very, very similar to each other. Task is designed to point to methods that basically don't return anything. Hey, they just do some little utility. So any method you write in .NET that doesn't return anything and has a void return type, you can call it with a task. 
What's the limitation? Well, you can't take in 17 parameters. You might be thinking, why in the world would I ever take in 17 parameters? Why? <laughs> well, you see, it's actually using delegates for these guys. There's a couple of delegates that they use for the task type, and uh, one of them is action and one of them is funk, F-U-N-C. The task and uh, task results will either use the action delegate or they can use the funk delegate. We'll look at those shortly here. There's also the task factory, which we have an example of, which can shorten up the amount of code you can write to go ahead and launch your task, creating multiple tasks. And then we have this really cool class called parallel. The parallel class actually has some methods in it, such as the for and the for each and invoke methods for launching multiple tasks. You know, just line them up like firecrackers and just go ahead and shoot those things off so we can have those all run simultaneously. So the task class, of course, is going to lie at the heart of the TPL because even if you go down the parallel route, you're really going to be using tasks to do that, okay? So tasks can call methods with a void return type if you're not specifying a T result. But if you do specify a T result, well, then you're basically specifying what type is going to be returned from that task type. Also, just to get it out of the way, I know this is one of those goofy things that you can kind of escape as a .NET developer for quite a long time, but it is worth your effort to learn about how to use that goofy Lambda operator. The Lambda operator, as much as it can be a little bit confusing to understand what it does, it's also at the heart of anonymous methods, and we use anonymous methods quite a bit when we get into, well, length, for example. If you've been creating MVC applications with your strongly typed views, you might be using the Lambda operator. You know, anytime we're dealing with um, perhaps a delegate, uh, an anonymous method, for example, you can use that Lambda operator. Let's just break it down a little bit to make sure you understand what the Lambda operator is. <clears throat> In .NET 2.0, I remember Microsoft, well, they were really excited about a lot of things, and they were rightly so. When .NET 2.0 came out in 2005, Microsoft really revamped the entire framework. They released a whole new version of .NET. They, they revamped a lot of things, including the web programming world with all their new web controls, uh, which is just go on and on with all the cool things they've added in. As you continue to study .NET, you realize that 2.0 is revolutionary. Generics, I mean, I can just go on and on here. But one of the things they also did was they created something called an anonymous method. For example, if you wanted to ever create an event handler, instead of just specifying the name of the method that you want to run in case of an event is raised, they thought that that would be a bit of a security risk because you're actually adding additional methods to your class. So if you think about it, if you have a button click event handler and you have that as a separate method, that clutters up your code, um, having that separate method. And maybe if it's marked as internal or even protected or public, somebody could actually call that method directly, and that's never been the intention of our event handlers. I want you to think about what they were thinking back in 2.0, okay? So they thought, well, let's allow people to create anonymous methods. An anonymous method could be like an inline method. Maybe you've done these in JavaScript. An anonymous method is when you actually define inline code. This is going to be one or more lines of code that I want to run when this event is reached. I'm sure you've done this in JavaScript, maybe using jQuery. Here we have a multiple of five reached event, and I'm saying plus equals the word delegate. We actually use the word delegate to define it, and then we define the actual parameters that get passed into the code that's down below in the curly braces. So in this case, I'm using the exact same pattern of the world's most famous delegate in the world, event args, or not event args, event handler. And you can see how we have object sender event args e. Now, I don't have to have parameters in there, but I decided to follow along with what all the standard event handlers are. And sure enough, down below, I can actually get access to those individual elements, like I'm using sender and E in my console write line. This is basically an anonymous method, a method without a name that's in line in my code. That's inside of my, uh, for example, my, uh, not my constructor, but inside of my class. So instead of me defining a whole separate method, I could use this delegate keyword. Basically, this is what the Lambda operator can do for you. The Lambda operator can shorten this up to make it much easier to type in. I could suggest here, since we know that the multiple of five reached event is based on a delegate, we can drop that delegate keyword. It knows that all events are based on delegates in .NET. 
So one of the things that they've done as they refined .NET, especially with .NET 3.5 and the introduction of the Lambda operator, is it made it so we don't have to type in all this junk. We don't have to say delegate, for example. We can just use this special Lambda operator, and we'll point to these two parameters that get passed into our chunk of code. Like so. Here's the exact same line of code, but using the Lambda operator. So we don't have to type in that goofy word delegate. We'll just say plus equals. We'll specify the arguments that go into the code down below. And this is all that the Lambda operator ever does. Okay? In .NET, this is all that it ever does. You'll specify zero or more arguments on the left side of it. They get passed into the code on the right side. It might be one line of code with no curly braces required, or it might be several lines of code with, with uh, curly braces that are required. If you do have two or more parameters that are passed in, then you need parentheses around them. But sometimes you'll just see a single object name here. Uh, and of course, that's not required to put parentheses around if it's only one argument. Or if there's no arguments, you might see just an open and close parentheses. This is all that the Lambda operator is. Remember, inside of your head, you have to say to yourself, under your breath, goes into. So you'd say object center event args goes into this chunk of code over here. So that's what we always say inside of our head, goes into. That's when that's how the Lambda operator works. And it's great how we're able to go ahead and do this for anonymous methods, but we use these Lambda operators everywhere. So that's why it's so important I'm stressing this. When you start working with tasks and you start working with the parallel, uh, the parallel object and you start working with some of these other technologies, there's always the assumption that, oh, you know, just use the Lambda operator. What? Make sure you understand how to use these things. The task type will use it, like I suggest, to call and pass values into anonymous instances of delegates. The two most important delegates we have are action and func. Action delegates, pointing to methods that don't return anything, they have a void return type, or if you're a VB or a sub, and functions, which do return something. And you'll find those guys inside of MS Core Lib and System.Core assemblies. These delegates are also the same ones that are used by all the link extension methods. So if you were to go into Visual Studio, oh, how about I got a different one here? Let's go to the object browser. And if you do a, you know, do some uh, filtering here on .NET 4.5.1, if you go into MS Core Lib system, you will find all these action delegates. And look at that. It says it goes up to eight. It handles up to eight parameters, in other words. But if I scroll down here a little bit more, if I scroll down to the Fs, here's all the function ones. Again, you'll see they have a return type of T result. That's what's different between func and action. Remember, these are delegate declarations that you have to still instantiate and have it pointing to a method. And we use the task type with these. The task automatically uses these delegates. These are the ones that go up to eight that are available in MS Core Lib. But if you actually go to system.core, you know, if you go into the system namespace, you can find the ones that go up to 16 parameters. And that's what I was talking about if you need to pass in 17, right? <laughs> you might be in trouble. But you can define your own delegate as well. These are the ones that Microsoft created for us. So here, the other, Microsoft decided with .NET 4.0, they're like, whoops, uh, we need to add some more delegates to handle more parameters. So in case you have 16 parameters, that's one heck of a method. You should have a good reason for doing that. Maybe not gathering those up into a struct and passing them in or something. But nonetheless, we do have these different types of delegates that are always available for a lot of different things within the .NET framework. It's kind of neat to just kind of browse around and see where those guys are. Okay, so these delegates are the ones that might be used with the task type to call any method. Know that those delegates are being used in the background by the task type. A task represents that asynchronous unit of work, just like a different thread pointing to another method. Here, for example, is a brand new task. And you can see that within this code example, I'm pointing to a method called display time, which is right down below here. And I call t.start. Away we go. Just like how I'd create a brand new thread. I could say thread t equals new thread passing it in. And thread you know, t.start, I would launch it. The problem is, and you'd have this problem with the thread as well, it's not going to stick around and wait for your task to finish. So right now, this little code is going to run asynchronously on a separate thread, but the primary thread is like, see ya. See, the, one of the things about the task type, if you launch it this way, is it's going to be considered a background thread. If that's the case, don't worry. 
you can take a look at T dot in your IntelliSense, and you would see there's actually a wait method that can be used. Problem solved, right? Uh, with the T dot wait, this will actually wait until that thread completes before it continues on. And then we would actually see that council right line display the current time. So this is one little trick we can do. This is one of the many methods we have available with the task type. This is introducing you to the task. There's much more that we can do with it than this. If you want to create a brand new task using one of those cool delegates I was showing you, right, like the action or func delegate, well, here we go. Here I've got the action delegate, and I'm pointing it to the method display time. Now, remember, the reason I'm using an action delegate is because this method doesn't return anything. It's a void return type. So I go ahead and call start and wait, and away we go. But what if I wanted uh, to be even shorter yet? You know, back here, I'm having to create a whole new task, and then I'm having to call start every single time. I want to do it in one line of code. Well, Microsoft was thinking, and they said, let's go ahead and create something called the factory object, which is used for creating several threads or tasks, in other words. And we could choose a start new method pointing at display. So this will not only create it, but it'll also start it. So there is a start new method which can shorten up the previous code. That's basically what it does for us by using the start new method. I also put together an example just for the heck of it. I modified my display time down below. It's really subtle, guys. I should have highlighted the change, but instead of it doing a council right line down below, like I was doing here, I was just doing a council right line of current time. This one is just going to return the current time. I didn't want it to actually do a console right line. I wanted it to return it. And you can see the method is returning a string. And then with that, I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new task that's going to deal with that return type. Now remember, if I'm calling a method that returns a, a string, I'm not going to be dealing with the action delegate. I'm going to be working with the func delegate. And inside of my um, angle brackets, the less than greater than characters, I'm going to have to specify the data type. Now, this is getting ridiculous. I actually got the word string in here three times on this one line of code. So here I'm creating the task, which returns a type of string. T equals a new task, which returns a type of string. Creating a brand new instance of the function delegate, which will return a type of string, pointing officially to the display time method. Then I'm calling the start method because I didn't use factory in this example, and I'm waiting. And then I counsel write the results. Actually, I don't think waiting is required. Because it's calling a function delegate, it was going to wait anyways. But I did have to call start, and then I can actually write the result. Now, what's interesting here, folks, is that when you specify a return type like this and you have it inside of your angle bracket such as this, it could be anything. It could be an instance of a customer. It could be something richer, an order, an order item, a product. It doesn't have to be something as silly as a string. No matter what it is, it's always going to come back in this variable called result. There's this property off the task type called result, and don't worry, it will be strongly typed to whatever type your task was defined as. So when you created that task and you said string, it automatically said result is type string, and that's why I'm able to do a console right line on it. Now, if it was a product type, well, then I'd probably grab that T dot result dot whatever property I'm looking for off of that product, maybe product ID, product name, or whatever. But it should be a product type that's returned then. But this is a lot of typing, always instantiating that goofy delegate. And you can see where I'm headed, right? My comment here is spelled, spelled at all. It's basically time for a Lambda operator. With the Lambda operator, I can dramatically shorten up my source code. And I left the original one up there in a comment just so you guys could see it. Notice how I'm also able to take advantage of a new method here, guys. I'm calling run directly off the task. I'm not saying new anymore. I dropped the word new. And I basically said, yep, task string t equals, and I'm just calling task.run. So this is a static method available off the task type. I am specifying string again. But this time, I'm actually just calling display time. I'm not passing any parameters into display time. So this is how I read it. Nothing goes into <laughs> display time. There's no parameters that are passed into this method down below here. So I don't really have to specify anything. Nothing goes into that. And here I'm, of course, writing out the result. So this is showing me doing the exact same thing, still using that func delegate, but the Lambda is figuring it out, and so is the compiler for me automatically. So it's saving a lot of work for me.
The var keyword could have also been used. Absolutely. If you want to use the var keyword, I just I saw a question pop up about using var. Um, the var keyword is something that can be used in C sharp. Be careful with using the var. I think the var keyword can sometimes be um, what's the word for it? Abused. I want to make sure that when I'm using the var keyword, I'm able to look to the code to the right side and determine what is actually being returned. Okay, and var should never be confused with dynamic either. Dynamic actually allows a variable type to be determined at runtime, and it can change types. Instead, var is determined at compile time. I've seen this a lot of coding where they'll just use the var keyword over on the left side for everything. Even on factory methods, methods that return a brand new instance, they're always just using the var keyword. And, and sometimes I think that's a little more difficult to figure out what's actually being returned from a method. But this is only personal preference. Compilers don't care. So just do whatever your team is doing. I know there are tools out there that recommend you use the var keyword everywhere. Like I think there's ReSharper that prefers to use the var keyword. It's a recommendation. But that's going to be about personal preference. So using var maybe on the left side. OK. So after calling run, the main thread is blocked. No, that's very important. When I call the, oh, I see what you're saying, because it is returning some data. Um, it is being, yeah, I guess it would be, because it otherwise, you know what it is? I think it's the result that's blocking it. I think it's getting the actual result property, and I think that's what's actually doing the blocking part of it. That's kind of an interesting thought, yeah. Um, because the run idea, if you're doing task that run, it shouldn't do a block because that's the whole idea of running a task is to run it asynchronously. But I think it's when we call the T result, it's like calling an end in bulk almost, waiting for it. Uh, I wonder if I have this example available where we can just try an experiment with that. Like maybe I can go to my slide there and I'll just borrow that code. Hang on, guys. It's such a tiny example, why not? So I'm going to go ahead and copy this and just break it right into here. There we go. Now let's see how this runs. OK, it's displaying the current time, which is great. Now what happens if I do a CW and hi inside of here? So it displayed hi, and then it displayed the time. So that well, basically that tells me it's running that, and it's calling display time, which is returning the time. Can't spell, but that's good enough. And, and hi in method. That's interesting. How hi came up first, and then because that the net, the primary thread continued on, then in the method actually ran. And then we got the actual time to be displayed. What if I didn't do this? What if I didn't bother with the result? High in method. Yeah, obviously we're not writing anything wrong. But uh, so I think it's T result that's doing the block, I'm trying to get the result back. Task result type. It's the result of the task. Once the result is available, it is stored and we return immediately on a call to the result. Okay. I'll have to do some more digging into that. That's pretty interesting. Good question. Folks, with the task type, we also have the parallel class. This can be used, of course, to execute several tasks simultaneously. You know, for example, we do have some great methods off the parallel type, such as invoke, which means go ahead and call these three separate unrelated methods that have no dependencies between each other. Or I can do the four. For example, I might want to loop through a predetermined number of items inside of an array or a collection. Or for each means just basically call all the methods on all the items. So I need to call one or more methods on all the items inside of a collection. I can do that with any of these different methods that are static methods available off the parallel class. OK. Here, for example, I went ahead and modified my stacker. Yeah, the presentation slides will be available, too, if you guys want a copy of them, absolutely. Uh, know that my method here, where I was working with the threads, 
I'm actually going to go ahead and modify my code to use parallel invoke instead. So instead of all this ugly clues up here, this messy green code, I commented that out, where I was creating all three threads and start, start, start on my for loop. I'm doing a parallel.invoke, and I'm calling process orders and stack. So this one's just going to go ahead and process the orders in the stack with my parallel invoke to go ahead and pass three threads into that process method and go ahead and run them all. So I have that example available here. If I go to, oh, that different project. This is the wrong version of Visual Studio, isn't it? Yes, it is. I wonder if I'm having problems with that. So let's go back into Studio 2012. Close that. And go to my recent projects, because I've got my parallel stacker. That's this one right here. What I decided to do instead was, um, in this case, I'm calling process orders and stack. And I'm calling the method three times. This is, in effect, creating three different tasks. Notice how I'm using the Lambda operator. Nothing goes into this method to process orders and stack. And instead, inside of here, we're still dealing with the exact same code. I haven't changed any of this. What this code is going to do with all three of those tasks, as they come in here and execute, they're going to remove everything out of that stack. Safely remove them one at a time, but, well, knowing fully well there are multiple threads jamming through here, and when they're done, they're done. Now, I can go ahead and easily add more process orders in stack if I want multiple threads to run that. Let's say, for example, I have to process all the images inside of a folder. I might want to do uh, multiple pro parallel invokes. Unfortunately, here I'm controlling the number of threads, right? I'm always saying call in these three to go ahead and do that work. But there are other methods I can use as well, such as parallel four. In this case, I'm doing a parallel four, which is counting from zero to the actual number in my collection, creating a variable here called index that's actually going to be passed into display single order. So what this is going to do is loop from zero to 100. That's the count, right? Passing that into display single order, and then I'm just writing out the order details, writing out what that order is at that particular location. And I'm doing that all with a single line of code here for parallel four. So if I go ahead and run this, I can see how at the very beginning here, I have the order details showing up. And notice how we're getting such different numbers for this. Yeah, John, I believe um, uh, the other gentleman I was on here will help you with the slides. Okay. How come my uh, WebEx? Okay, so let me go ahead and finish up this window here. Hey, Kevin, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, we'll have these uh, posted by next Tuesday. We'll have the presentation and the slides. Okay. And uh, I will send an email out. To you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, folks, so uh, as you can see, I was able to go ahead and cycle through each of the items within the collection, and then I was also able to do process order stack. And what I wanted you guys to see on that was that it's still, we have different threads here. We have three, nine, and 10. So there's still three threads, but notice how we have different threads showing up, maybe for other processes that are running, or maybe for another council window I didn't close yet. <laughs> so there's a lot of different ways. Again, go to the parallel class, Take a look at some of the other members. There's not a ton of them here, right? There is a strongly type four as well. Um, you can see this one here is also available, and then we also have the four each. And here's our parallel four as well. Okay. Just a couple of slides to wrap up here, guys, and let you get going here. Um, some user interface threading techniques, just the basics here. Make sure you know that only one thread should ever be in charge of updating the user interface. Child threads um, should not be in control of the user interface. Only the main thread that's in charge should be um, updating the user interface. That's extremely important, whether it be a Windows format, a WPF app, or maybe you're doing one of those new universal apps for multiple platforms. Also, if you do need to do additional tasks in the background when you're working with one of these style of applications, you may want to consider a special type called the background worker. Background worker has been around since .NET 2.0, but the background worker type will actually allow you to even update progress as something's happening in the background, all while maintaining that user interface and making sure that it is interactive for the user.
We want to make sure, you know, that the user has a current status. They know something's happening. They can find out how the data is moving along, whatever it is, and yet they can still enter information into a form, minimize it, maximize it, move it around, whatever they want to do. Background worker is one way to do that. Um, they do have a code example here as well to take a look at the background worker. It looks like I did not officially hit enter on it to make it a hyperlink. Now it is. And if I click on that guy, you can see the background worker. This has been around, like I said, for a long time. It's interesting uh, namespace. It's under system.component model. And you can find some code examples in here how to use this, especially like working with events such as run worker completed and progress changed. You can also cancel events as well. As well, That's something else that is supported. <laughs> okay. If you do multiple threads, the application will automatically take advantage of multiple core processor. Yes, absolutely. By default, it will. As a matter of fact, I had an example I was putting together earlier where I wanted to see a simulation of starving a thread. This sounds horrible, right? Nobody wants to see this. But what we have here is I wanted it to show how you starve a thread. Thread starving is when you have one thread that's hogging all of your processor and maybe another one that is actually um, not getting enough processor, that's an actual thread starve. The problem is if I try to run this application without locking it down to one core, the other, th the other core is going to automatically be thrown in by .NET to take advantage of it. So what I had to do up here is I had to grab my current process using a cool process class. You should explore this if you get some time. It's really neat. Um, and I'm setting processor affinity to one particular core. That way I could actually test this application and see this start. I'm trying to increment a number and how one's going to be much higher than the other because if his priority was cranked up to high, well, the other one had a very low priority. Look at that. There are a couple of 64-bit ints. One got up to 5 billion while the other got to 33. Now, if, notice how much different those are. That is definitely a star of thread. Thread one had that low priority set up on him. You notice how we have the uh, priorities at the five different levels here. Okay, and if I just get rid of this one line of code, meaning comment it out, and rerun the exact same application again, you're going to see that the the other cores are going to come in to help and say, well, you know, we, we have other cores that are running, and um, now that I'm not locked into one core, we're getting numbers that are very similar, so almost identical. Other cores can jump in in case he has a low priority on one core. But again, that one little line of code up there, lock it into one particular processor, and then all of a sudden start starving threads. Okay. Async and await should be something you should consider on any of your event handlers where you need to do some heavier duty processing uh, in the background while you want to maintain your user interface and making sure that it's interactive. Async and await are, of course, a couple of keywords that were introduced simultaneously with .NET 4.5. Know that the async keyword doesn't really have a purpose. The only real purpose of the async keyword is to tell the compiler, hey, there's an await keyword coming up, so get ready for this, okay? You see, um, the await keyword is something that if it had been built into the C-sharp language way back when it was first introduced, it would always be something that would be represented and um, understood to be something that you want to run simultaneously. But the async keyword is actually a flag to the compiler that in case there is any await keywords coming up, they're meant to be used with the async keyword. The await keyword is really where all the magic happens. Understand that when you use an async and await, you're always going to use these two together. Async, for example, to mark the method as being an async method. And the await keyword, somewhere inside of your method, where you might be calling another method or a chunk of code that you actually want it to run. Now, it's not going to run it on a separate thread. Instead, it's going to run on the same thread, but the primary thread will go back and return the user interface to the user so they can do something. Meanwhile, it's going to balance out and run that secondary method that you're pointing to. I don't want to say thread because it really isn't. It's the same thread, but it's going to balance it out and run that and complete that method, and when it's done, it could actually return data that you could update the user interface with. So if I go back to Visual Studio here, and I go to my recent projects, do I have an async await? Sure I do, right here. 
This is a very simplistic form, guys. I've got two labels, which you can't see because I set their text to nothing. And I've got two button buttons here. And their click event handlers are a little bit different. This one here for get date has got a method marked as async. And he also has await. Now understand, when, he, when you see this word await, it has to have an async in the beginning of it. This is going to call the method get time, which is right down here. Notice that this method is also marked as async, and it's returning a task which has a data type of string. Down below here, I'm calling task.run, specifying a string type, and I'm returning the current date time to long date string. And of course, I'm using my Lambda operator. I'm also making it pause for five seconds. Okay, I actually want to pause it for five seconds because I want you to see what happens when I'm using the async and await combination together here. This is ultimately going to return the result, which comes back here and updates a label with the current date. Now, the key is when I run this, I'll just go ahead and start this guy up. Watch what happens. I'll click on get date, and then I can still move this guy around, okay? I can resize him and everything else, as long as I don't lose a handle to him. And eventually, he comes back, and he updates that label control with the current date. I can do it again. And again, this thing remains reactive. I can go ahead and maximize or whatever, right? And eventually the date comes back. Hard to tell, right? <laughs> well, let's try this. I'll go ahead and close it and restart it. I'm going to click on get date this time. Here we go. And I'm going to click on get time a bunch of times. So you can see the seconds are changing as I click on get time. It's actually getting the current time. And then on its own accord, you can see the date was eventually returned, and the label was, of course, updated. I believe you have to use the wait to wait for it as well. The wait is where it's doing that. Um, question, could you just use async result, async only, same result? You might be able to. I'm not completely sure where you put just the async. Or could you just do a task run? Remember, it has to be the primary thread that updates the user interface, and that's what's different about this. We have to make sure that it's the primary thread itself that does the update on the user interface. If we wanted to, oops, I'll go ahead and stop the bugging. If I wanted to, I could go ahead and take, put in a sleep on my regular get time one. And what's interesting about this is if I go ahead and run it and click on get time, now it's paused, and now I can't move it, I can't resize it, and it seems to be frozen up until it eventually comes back with that time. And this is what we were trying to get around by using the async and the await down below, where we don't have to, um, where we can still move this form around, maybe entering information into a text boxes or what have you. So those are some of the things that we're trying to do with uh, the async and the await. Something else you may have heard of if you decide to create a brand new, oh, I don't know, let's say I just go ahead and create a brand new ASP.NET if I was going on the MVC route. You may have heard of this, that controllers can now have this in our action methods. And you may be wondering, why in the world would I ever want to do this? That's actually a pretty valid question. Why would you ever want to put async and await inside of a controller method. So if I open up a controller, maybe the home controller, and I decide to make this an async method here, I'd put that in here, when would I ever do this? Well, a couple of important things. The only time you should ever use async and await inside of a controller, of maybe an MVC application specifically, would be if you're going to do something that's not processor intensive. They're telling you if you're doing something processor intensive, this is not going to save you anything. Because remember, the whole world of the web is based on somebody's web browser out there making a request to your server, processing on the server side to generate a response, and sending it back to the client. But what they recommend using async and await for here maybe is if I was creating additional HTTP clients and I was downloading additional source code, source code files or making, making other web requests off the Internet and I was going to gather up those results to send them to as the model, maybe off to a view or something. That might make sense where you want to use async and a, you know, the a wait, but uh, not to do anything just processor intensive, not CPU processor intensive. Instead, they recommend that 
using async and await only if you're going to be like doing other things such as downloading files or, or where you want to do those simultaneously. I could use a, a multiple task, for example, to download three files at the same time. So those are some of the little tricks I recommend with an MVC style application. And there's an example of what I was putting together there. Just a simple little example of the sync and await. For the most part, they recommend that your methods, like the async one here, is returning a task of some type. You can also make your methods return void, but you should have a good reason why. There's some interesting articles on the web, too. But there, you should have a really good reason why you might want to call a method that's just going to do a void return type. I mean, what's the advantage other than maybe the fact that you want the user interface to be updated or maybe you want to remain reactive. There's just some interesting arguments out there about having a void return type, but it is supported as well, having a void type or returning a task type with an async and a await type. Guys, um, basically, just some last points here. Debugging async code in Visual Studio 2013. Remember that you can use some of the new debug windows inside of Visual Studio. So when you actually start up a debug session, um, unless you screwed it up like I did. Let me go to a previous project here. I'll just open this one up. Um, sometimes some of the windows are not available unless you're in debug mode. So know that since I started a debug session, of course, we have our stop and our restart and all that. Off the debug menu, you can go to Windows, and then here on the left or on the right side, now all of a sudden we have these choices like I can debug the task. I can bring up a special tasks window here. Something else that's available off the debug menu, if I want to, I can bring up GPU threads if I was a C++ developer. Parallel stacks, parallel watches are kind of interesting. Also, I do have access to the different threads as well. So I might want to take a look at the threads that are available. Uh, know that a lot of these menu options are completely gone if you stop debugging, and that's the key. You know, you can also set up memory watches as well. So, for example, if I stop debugging, just at the big old red stop, and I go to debug menu, all of a sudden, that's it. You know, this is what the Visual Studio does by default, and it's been doing this for years. But I wanted you guys to know that there are other windows that can help you actually debug your uh, application. And uh, let's see. Yeah, those menus. Okay, guys, so some of the books that I recommend. I've got my favorite book listed right at the top here. This is an A-Press book. It's ProAsynchronousProgramming.net. It's not a... You know, super hard read. He does a great job of explaining exactly what is going on, and he does focus a lot on the new stuff as well as some of the old stuff as well. And this is an A Press book with the ISBN that I've got up here, and also another book that I'm that I find to be uh, incredibly helpful and deep, maybe a little too deep in some respects, is this one on performance. The Pro .NET Performance is going to focus more on just whatever it takes to make your applications run faster. If you wanted to make sure the book wasn't too light and fluffy, this is a perfect book for you. They actually go into taking a look at even an unsafe code using IEL, the proper way of doing garbage collection, serializing objects, GPU computing, and they also talk about parallelism and multi-threaded programming. The Pro.NET Performance book is not for the lighthearted, but it's a great book. Plus, they also recommend certain tools for um, watching your applications, even monitoring uh, your applications and your resource usage. There is a great little O'Reilly book here on concurrency. This book is great because it's going to focus strictly on the TPL. Uh, I read it in one of these books. It's just kind of funny, but one of the books just flat out said, if you're not using the TPL, you're doing it wrong. They just feel you're, if you're using any of the primitives at all, then you're missing out, that we shouldn't have to bother with the primitives anymore. I thought that was rather opinionated, but <laughs> it's a little strong there. But, uh, yeah, the TPL is a great way, of course, doing asynchronous programming. Also, there is one on Parallel Extensions Cookbook, which, um, unfortunately for that book, it, it's a great cookbook. It's got a lot of great little examples in it, and that's, that's exactly what it is. What I didn't like about the fact is it wasn't any cheaper to buy if I'd have just gone into a bookstore. There was no deal on it on Amazon. It's just the same price. Also, Microsoft does have the Parallel Programming book, or not pro book, but the blog, the Parallel Programming blog, which is um, they talk about a lot of the different things with async and await. You should check out this blog as well. Maybe if I go to my slide here, 
go down a little bit further right there. And I just select all this good stuff and send it through the chat window for you guys. We should be able to get access to it. You can download all these versions uh, of the books. Like, for example, you can get them through you know, Amazon with, with uh, your Kindle reader or whatever. I don't know if any of these books are for free, but if you have a Safari or if you have a Kindle, you can also buy all of these books in digital format as well. Okay. All right. So those are some of the resources that I found to be incredibly helpful. I really like that blog too, by the way. It is by the parallel uh, for the parallel programming team at Microsoft and by their different developers. Although it's been about a year since there was an entry, but they talk about a lot of the different things, like using async and await, making sure that you don't just blindly throw that on any old method, thinking it's going to run asynchronously. You do have to do. You have to have some knowledge about exactly how to use that. Okay, so that basically wraps up this presentation. Um, just a couple other points here that we have for our next Oxygen Blast coming up in October. This is the opposite of Microsoft programming, but the future of iPhone and iPad programming using Swift. And also know that I did mention in some C-sharp classes that we do have. Guys, um, just so everybody's aware, if you take a class with us at Intertech and, you, you know, you buy the book, you buy the class, you come to our class either local or you take it virtually, you can retake it again for free up to a year. So there's a lot that's covered in our 2483 class on C-sharp. I just delivered this last week. It's actually a WPF application that you create. And within this application, you add all kinds of features, including we have that chapter on asynchronous programming as well. But if some of that stuff seems a little over your head, you can always come back and retake it for free. Just don't lose your book. And of course, yeah, Intertech also has our C-Sharp consulting team as well. A larger part of Intertech besides training is our consulting division. Folks, I went ahead and left our feedback up here for Patrick and I, our uh, our, our uh, actual email addresses. So if you want to contact us about anything, you're more than welcome to please go ahead and send me an email. I always hear from students that are asking questions about how to do something in .NET or Microsoft technology related. I haven't really uh, focused in on other technologies. Like I don't teach a Java classes or anything like that. But if it's got a Microsoft logo on it, I may have played with it. Maybe I have some ideas for you. I'm not going to have the solutions. But also know, guys, that when you know when you take training with us, you're taking with Intertech, not just Davin, because Davin doesn't know everything. So, all right. <laughs> so thanks very much, guys, for spending an hour and a half with me. Looks like it did take an hour 45. It was a little long. Sorry about that. And, uh, Pat, like he said, we're going to have everything available for the public. So that should be it. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.